Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all under arrest. Thank you. I've always wanted to say that. Tonight, uh, we have Jeff Lenza, and, and, and many of you will know Jeff's name. Many of you will have heard Jeff uh, on radio uh, or seen him on TV. Uh, he's, he's certainly been on a lot of local TV as the spokesman, the longtime spokesman for the FBI. He's also been on a lot of national uh, TV, uh, you know, from Good Morning America to, uh, uh, let's see, Good Morning America to Today Show, Larry King Live, Hannity and Combs, Fox and Friends, CNN, Wolf Blitzer, National Public Radio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's been an FBI, he was an FBI agent for 20 years. Uh, he investigated corruption, corporate fraud, money laundering, computer crime, organized crime. He was the head of internal security of the Kansas City FBI before he became the regional spokesperson, which he was for many years. Um, he's become a professional speaker, making presentations uh, around the country. Uh, he has a program that he does on leadership ethics with Mark Whitaker, uh, the ADM executive who was the subject of the, uh, uh, the amazing, amusing movie, The Informant. Um, uh, he's a great crisis communicator, uh, and uh, he, he's uh, got a master's degree in, uh, in business administration from the University of Texas and a BA from, in criminal justice from the University of New Haven in uh, Connecticut. Uh, He's also written this wonderful book, Pistols to Press, which you can buy from his wife outside, who will tell you the real story after he tells you his story. Um, and, uh, and I just want to read just one little section, because uh, it's, it's, it's about the good old days in Kansas City. Uh, at one point, several members of the Kansas City, Missouri City Council had been officially charged with violations of federal law. The mayor of Kansas City was asked by a newspaper reporter how the situation might affect the public's perception of his administration. He said that the city's problems could lead voters to think less of politicians. <laughs> Trying to put a positive spin on the issue, he added that the majority of the city council had not been indicted. <laughs> now, Jeff, who is a stickler for getting the facts right, points out that technically, if he was talking about the supermajority of two-thirds, that he was right. However, the FBI had indicted a simple majority of the city council. The good old days when we indicted him instead of re-electing them. <clears throat> but anyway, la la ladies and gentlemen, uh, longtime FBI agent uh, and crime communicator extraordinaire, Jeff Lanza. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm so honored to have uh, to have so many people come out tonight on this, um, this very freezing cold evening, but again, thank you for coming. I was with the FBI, as Crosby said, for 20 years. Most of my career, I was involved in white collar crime. No, wait a minute, let me take that back. I investigated white collar crime. I wasn't involved in white collar crime myself, but I had the opportunity to talk to lots of different audiences over the years, and you get a lot of questions about the FBI. The three most asked questions that I got uh, from the groups I talked to, three most asked questions were these. Have you ever been shot? Have you ever shot anyone? And did J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI for 48 years, did he really wear a red dress? <laughs> so let me, uh, I feel it necessary to answer those questions in order. The answer to those questions are in order, no, no, and no comment. <laughs> if you could sum up 20 years of my career uh, with one picture, it would, be, it would be this one. And that's a picture of me holding a baby that had been kidnapped from Kansas University Medical Center in 1998 taken right out of the mother's room. And this story has a really happy ending. So I'm going to save the ending to the uh, very end of my presentation. But this kind of sums up the most important case I was ever involved in with the FBI. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself right now uh, because the story for me really starts here. It starts on a Sunday night in 1968. And if you were watching network television on Sunday nights, because we didn't have cable back then, so you probably were watching network television on Sunday nights, you were watching, and uh, well, we've already mentioned the book here, you were probably watching one of these three shows at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, which is the time zone that I lived in, uh, you're watching either the FBI, which is on the ABC television network, the Ed Sullivan Show, which was on the CBS television network, or the last half of Walt Disney's Wonderful Wide World of Color on ABC. For me, it was the FBI show. And I watched that show every night, uh, every Sunday night, when I was growing up. And the actor that started in that show was a guy named Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. And he was an actor that played 
a role uh, in the uh, in the show. His and his uh, his name in the show was Inspector Erskine. And I watched that show religiously as a young kid. I said, "That's what I want to be when I grow up." He was a man of justice. He was a man of integrity. And besides that. They wore these beautiful suits in the show. I love the suits they wore. And they got to carry guns under those suits. And they solved crimes in 60 minutes. So that was, that was a job for me. So that got me interested in the FBI from television. And then I started to, to get into my teenage years. And I started really paying attention then to real life news stories about the FBI. And so along comes a case in 1974, which many of you uh, will remember. It's the kidnapping of a woman named Patty Hearst. This was a huge uh, case in, in California, and the FBI worked on this case. And it came to be uh, determined that Patty Hearst actually joined with her kidnappers, and she started robbing banks with her kidnappers. And there's a picture from one of her bank robberies with the machine gun over her shoulder. And the FBI worked this case in real life. In fact, it, the New Newsweek magazine describes it as the saga of Patty Hearst. The FBI did catch her. She went to jail. And I said, now this is real life. This is what the FBI gets to do. And that's what convinced me that I wanted to become an FBI agent. So the next picture that you're going to see happens uh, to be taken in Quantico, Virginia in 1988. It was a very proud day for me. I walked across the stage, a uh, stage somewhat like this, and got my credentials to become an FBI agent after many weeks of training in, in this uh, facility at the FBI Academy. So there's a picture now of me getting my credentials in 1988. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know, it cracks me up too. That, that, <laughs> that wasn't Groucho Marx joining the FBI. That was actually me at that, uh, at that time in 1988. Okay, so one more thing, and then we'll get into the material that I, you really want to hear about tonight. Uh, when you take your family on a vacation and you work for the FBI, you get to do something special. So in Washington, D.C., I took my family on a tour of the FBI building, like the public would. And at the end of the tour, because I worked for the FBI, they did something special at the end. They took my uh, family in a room and they took a picture of my family. Before they did that, they handed my kids the guns that the gangsters used to use back in the old days. So this is a picture of my family in 2001. It was taken right after that. Uh, <laughs> So if you stop at the table on the way out, you will see my daughter, Angela, who's now 16 years old, my wife, Pam, and uh, my son, Chris, is not here tonight because he's away at college in California. But I look at that picture today, and particularly of Angela, my daughter, who's only five at the time that this picture was taken. They hand her a machine gun, and it's a real gun, and she strikes this pose with the gun, which is almost as big as she is and heavy, and uh, it reminds me of that picture of Patty Hearst that you just saw. So I had to take a little closer look. And yeah, she does look a lot like Patty Hearst. <laughs> the other day, we're driving down the road, and she says, hey, Dad, you mind if we stop at the bank? I said, yeah, we're not going to any bank. You have the same grip as Patty Hearst. Um, all right, so enough of that. Uh, when I, when I got assigned to Kansas City, I grew up in Connecticut. I had no idea what Kansas City was going to be like. In fact, the way the FBI assigns people to uh, its field offices throughout the country, at least in 1988, was they call every agent individually up from the class, and you get uh, stand in front of the room, and you get an envelope, you open it up, and there's a piece of paper that tells you what city you're going to be sent to. And I could have been sent anywhere in the United States. And on my piece of paper, it says I'm sent to Kansas City. So I read that to the class, which we all had to do, and I said, I've been assigned to Kansas City. And I didn't know anything about Kansas City. I didn't know what to think. But there's a couple of guys in the class that are from Kansas City that are in my agent's training class. And they're going to some other place. And they start cheering and clapping like crazy. Yeah, you're going to Kansas City. Yeah, you're going to Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. So of course, it's a very emotional day. And I don't know what to do. They're clapping. I start clapping. Yeah, OK, I'm going to Kansas City. I'm going to Kansas City. I go sit down at my, at the, at my desk. And, and I'm thinking, what am I cheering about? What am I clapping about? I don't want to go to Kansas City. <laughs> but as it turns out, it, it was a great choice and a great, uh, uh, I was so happy to be sent here because I found out a lot about Kansas City. And it is a great place to live and raise a family. And there's great people in this community. I also knew that Kansas City uh, was very uh, well interconnected with the beginnings of the FBI. In fact, most of you know, if, you've, uh, if you have any uh, sense of history in, in this city, that the Kansas City massacre was the beginning of the modern FBI. It took place right here uh, in Kansas City at Union Station. And prior to June 17, 1933, the FBI had been in existence for, for many years, 25 years. But the agents didn't carry guns. They, didn't make, they couldn't make arrests. They had no power to do that. And they were a small agency that only investigated white-collar crimes, antitrust violations, uh, uh, slavery, 
uh, excuse me, white, it was called the White Slave Trade Act, uh, prostitution cases, if they wanted to make an arrest, they had to grab a U.S. Marshal or a detective with the police department to go make that arrest with them. Very uh, uh, powerless agency for, for, for the most part, until this happened. And when this happened, three police officers were killed and one FBI agent named Raymond Caffrey was killed as they were escorting a prisoner taken from the train station and being brought from Oklahoma where he arrived in Kansas City and was going to be taken to Leavenworth. His name was Frank Nash. After this uh, bloodbath on, uh, on that day, the FBI shortly thereafter got the power to carry guns, the power to make arrests, and everything changed because this was a watershed event in Kansas City and uh, we, we, our, whole, uh, our whole history changed because of this event. And I have a very unique connection to this event. I never uh, expected it and it's very coincidental, but about 1990 or so, I had been in Kansas City for a couple of years and they told me, at FBI headquarters called me and said that the badge I was carrying was actually carried by a guy that was in the Union Station Massacre. And that's the badge I carried throughout my career. Now this uh, agent named Frank Smith was an agent back in 1933 uh, he was present at the Union Station Massacre, the only agent that wasn't uh, shot uh, and injured or killed that day, and he uh, carried this badge later in his career, 1935, when we were renamed the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He got that badge. When he retired, he gave it back to the Bureau. It went to another agent, went to another agent, and so forth, and I eventually got that badge when I, when I graduated from the FBI Training Academy. Now when agents retire, they get to keep their badge. So I had that throughout my career and I still have that today. So I was, uh, by coincidence, uh, connected a little bit to the Union Station Massacre. Very proud, proud to be connected to that historic event. So back to Kansas City for a minute. So as I'm done with my training, I get my credentials, I'm heading out to Kansas City, leaving Quantico, Virginia. I really don't know too much about Kansas City or what it's going to be like at that time. And one of the agents who had been around for a long time, a veteran FBI agent at Quantico, he'd been, he'd been training people at Quantico, he came up to me and he said, Jeff, you're going to Kansas City, you are going to love Kansas City. And I said, really? Why? And I thought he was going to say because there's lots of uh, uh, good people in Kansas City, cost of living is low, good barbecue, I don't know what he's going to say, why am I going to love Kansas City? And he says, because they have some great organized crime in Kansas City. <laughs> And what do I do? I pump my fist. I go, yeah, that's great, great. That's a great reason to love a city because there's great organized crime here. He said, he said, have. He should have used the past tense. He should have said had. Because uh, from this case uh, that you see profiled here in the New York Times, I got, in, I got to Kansas City in 88. This case involving the casino skimming that was taking place by the family here in Kansas City uh, from the Las Vegas casinos first was charged in 1983. The last trial in that case was in 1986. I had nothing to do with that case, and organized crime, for the most part, was uh, decimated in Kansas City after this case took place. So I was a little disappointed to find out that there wasn't great organized crime uh, in Kansas City uh, anymore. Now, most of you have heard this story, and you might hear it more from, uh, from uh, if you come to the presentation on Sunday, and I won't go into all the details about the mob, but they were skimming uh, uh, money from the cash count rooms at the two casinos in Las Vegas, very intricate operation, and they had to be pretty smart to do that. Uh, they manipulated the fill slips when they put chips into the casino tables. They count uh, the, the amount of money, the amount of chips that goes in. They change the fill slips so it would reflect a different amount so they can then skim it off from the cash count rooms. They actually changed the scales that were used to weigh the coins coming out of the slot machines so it looked like there were less coins in the bag than there were, and they skimmed that off when it was converted to cash. They were really smart about doing that. It went on for a long period of time. Now, when I got here, the mob was pretty much decimated, as I say, but we did, I did get to work some mob cases, the remnants of what was left of the mob in Kansas City at that time. And you might be surprised that that same family who was skimming money from these Las Vegas casinos, the people that were left, you might be surprised to, to note that maybe they weren't as smart as the guys that came before them. Uh, let me give you an example of that. You probably didn't know. You probably didn't know that the mob self-insures itself uh, against uh, against auto accidents. Uh, I didn't. Uh, so this case takes place uh, in Kansas City. Uh, again, it's when I'm here, there's a mob conversation. Two mobsters are talking on the phone. Tony is talking to Joe. Tony's talking to Joe. The FBI has the phone tapped. We have a search warrant electronic. We're tapping the phone. Here's how the conversation goes as it transpires. Tony's talking to Joe. Tony says, Joe, I'm really glad you called. Joe says, why? Tony says, I have a little problem. I think the FBI is tapping my phone. <laughs> so Joe says, wow. Uh, well, what are you going to do about it? And Tony says, don't worry, I already got it figured out. I got it all taken care of. I got a new phone number. <laughs> so lacking any common sense whatsoever, Joe says, give me the number. 
And now, Tony, for a second, uh, the common sense creeps into his, head, his brain. And he says, I better not give you the number over the phone. I'll meet you for lunch today. I'll give it to you then. And Joe says, I can't meet you for lunch. Tony says, OK, all right, all right. I'll give you the number over the phone, but I'll give it to you backwards. <laughs> so he gave him the seven digits in reverse. What did the FBI do? We got our best cryptologist on that one right away. <laughs> Six months later, we had the number all figured out. So. Same mob, same group that was stealing money from the casinos had guys like this uh, in there. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about the mob. When I really started working here in Kansas City was corruption cases, and you kind of got a preview of what the next slide is going to be uh, from Crosby. But let me go into a little more detail about that. So on this corruption squad that I was working, we had worked uh, many cases, and several city council members in Kansas City, Missouri, were indicted. And the mayor, uh, Mayor Cleaver, who's now a U.S. congressman, was asked this question. He was asked a question by the Kansas City Star. Doesn't this speak poorly of your council? And as you heard from Crosby, he said, yeah. He said, yeah, but th this could lead voters to think less of politicians, all right? <laughs> but there's always a but. And as you heard from Crosby, the but in this case was, but the overwhelming majority of the city council wasn't indicted after all. And, and uh, yeah, two-thirds majority he was talking about. We had a simple majority indicted. Uh, I want to turn serious for a moment here, because uh, this is not all about, about uh, uh, making fun of some of the stuff that's gone on. A very serious case in Kansas City. I was not the case agent on this particular case, yeah, uh, but I worked very closely with the agents that were, and I also interviewed people that were affected by the unfathomable crime of diluting cancer medication and other medications. So let me touch on this for just a little bit. You may recognize this guy. His name is Robert Courtney. Robert Courtney was a pharmacist at the Research Medical Center Pharmacy, owned and operated by himself. And for a very long time, many, many years, he was actually diluting medications. Uh, he was compounding drugs in his pharmacy, and while he was compounding them, uh, and he, he diluted those significantly. Now, there was some suspicion that he was doing this because a pharmaceutical rep with uh, one of the ph major pharmaceutical companies suspected that Courtney was getting way too many, uh, way too, he was giving out way too many prescriptions for the amount of drugs that he was getting. And the, the uh, pharmacist actually thought he wasn't getting enough commissions. Uh, on the sales to, to Courtney. Something was wrong with the numbers. So he went to the oncologist who was prescribing many of the drugs that Courtney uh, diluted, and uh, she suspected a, a situation, maybe a problem with this. So she, she actually did a test. She sent six vials of, uh, excuse me, six prescriptions to Courtney, and he filled them with medication. And she took that medication and didn't give it to patients. She sent it to an FDA, FDA testing lab in Cincinnati. And there's an actual picture of the vials. And when those vials were sent to the lab in Cincinnati, the FDA tested them, and they came back with this report. And these are fake names, fictitious names up here. And, and what, they, what this report said was that Courtney was diluting the medication down, in some cases, to 0% of what it was supposed to be. And now, you may recognize Zofran, uh, Gemzar, actually. Gemzar is a cancer-fighting medication. Zofran is given to people that are getting cancer medication for, uh, uh, for nausea. And he diluted even, even the Zofran, he diluted down in some cases uh, to, to very, uh, less, much less than it was supposed to be. Uh, some cases, 0%, as you, as you can see. So this brought on the FBI investigation. And uh, it wasn't me that went to go talk to Courtney. But uh, several agents, uh, uh, one agent in, in, uh, in particular, went and talked to him with some help. And Courtney was asked the question, why, why are the numbers out of whack? Why are, are you prescribing so many drugs, but yet you're not buying so many drugs? And Courtney uh, responded by saying this to the agent that was interviewing him. He said, oh, yeah, I got, I got a solution for that. I got an answer to that. <clears throat> and he threw four prescriptions across the desk at the agent. And he said, I see these prescriptions? I've been actually filling these, not with drugs that I've been buying from Eli Lilly uh, or these other companies. I was actually getting them from a guy who was stealing them from a hospital in Colorado where they had very poor inventory control. And he said, that, that explains this discrepancy. Well, what we knew it was much bigger discrepancy than that. So Courtney, a lot of times when you find someone admits to a crime, admits to something they've done wrong, usually there's a lot more than that. It's the tip of the iceberg. Well, Courtney didn't just dilute four, four medications. He diluted, as you can see from this Kansas City Star article, he diluted 98,000 prescriptions over the course of his whole career as a pharmacist. He started from almost day one. 4,200 patients were affected by this dilution. Uh, and Courtney uh, had done that for profit. He did it for greed because some of those medications were four, three to four thousand dollars. And if he can dilute that and collect money from Medicare or other health insurance companies uh, for, for multiple times and only pay for a few doses, he was making a lot of money. And he certainly did. He made millions of dollars. Now, when Courtney was uh, sentenced in court and he apologized to the court finally after all the, the investigation took place and, 
and, and he went to court finally in February of 2002. Uh, I want you to look at his statement there. You can see the statement and he says there was no rational, and the word rational is really important to me because what he's saying there is he couldn't even justify his own behavior. It was so bad, it was so out of sorts. There was no rational explanation for that. So sometimes when people do things wrong, they tend to justify it in their own mind. There's a reason for it. He couldn't even do that. And what he's saying is he's a sociopath, and, and it doesn't matter. Whatever job he would have went into, he would have been a crook to begin with. And, uh, and now he's in jail for probably the rest of his life. He got sentenced to 30 years in prison. A very sad case for Kansas City. Uh, first time a pharmacist had ever been accused of looting these medications. But it was worked by the Kansas City FBI office, and uh, it was a very important case. Uh, worked off our white-collar crime squad there. Now, why I'm talking about drugs, Let's talk about a different kind of drugs, not pharmaceutical medication. Let's talk about uh, uh, drug investigations. I did have the opportunity to work some drug cases here in Kansas City, mostly tied to corruption. But the one I'm going to tell you about wasn't one I worked. It was one that I heard about from agents that worked in the office. They had a drug uh, case on a, on a group of uh, drug dealers in Kansas City, Kansas. And sometimes funny things happen in cases. Well, they got authority from the court to bug the drug dealer's house with a video camera to uh, capture evidence of their drug dealing. So installed in this house was this video camera, and on the video camera they had, it was attached to a transmitter, which was transmitting the signals from the, uh, from the video camera to the FBI office in Kansas City downtown, where it's being recorded. And again, it's all court approved and authorized. Well, one day the drug dealers weren't dealing drugs. They were sitting around their apartment, and they're watching television, and we're watching them watch TV. And they're watching a TV like this. Uh, this is an old-fashioned TV. And as you can see, it has rabbit ear antennas, no cable connection. And it beckons back to the day when it was a very sad day in our lives when you actually had to get up off the couch to change the channel on the television. Uh, but they had no, no remote control either. So they're watching uh, one afternoon, uh, we're watching your favorite show and mine, The Jerry Springer Show. And, and so they're watching Jerry Springer. We're watching them watch Jerry Springer. Nothing much is going on. And one of the drug dealers gets up to change the channel. He walks over to the television to change it. And he touches the TV, of course. And as he's touching the TV, the, uh, the TV moves and the antenna shifts a little bit. And all of a sudden, inexplicably, the antenna starts picking up the signal from our video camera uh, inside the house. So you know what happens now. They see themselves on television. And, and, they're screaming, they're, they're on TV, they're going, what are we doing on TV? How did we get on TV? What's going on here? We're back at the FBI office, the agent's looking at this image saying, oh my God, the whole case is blown now. They saw themselves on TV. Well, you know, they solved this problem very simply. What do you do? You see yourself on TV? No problem. Take a blanket and you put it over the television so you no longer could see yourself on TV. <laughs> they covered the TV with a blanket. And now, and I'm not making this up. It's too good, I can never think of anything like this. They're staring at a blanket on the TV. And, and now, just like out of a 1970s uh, situation comedy, the ringleader of the drug group walks in. He walks in and he goes, uh, uh, why is there a blanket on my TV? And they tried to explain to him, well, funny thing happened. We were watching Jerry Springer, and then all of a sudden, we were on TV. No, you weren't. No, no, we swear we weren't. No, you weren't. You've been using too many of your own drugs. You're supposed to sell your drugs, not use your drugs. You weren't on TV. Oh, yeah? We were. We'll show you. Takes the blanket, pulls it off, whips it off. As the TV, as he pulls the blanket off, the TV moves, antenna shifts. At that very instant, it goes back to the signal from Jerry Springer. <laughs> Jerry Springer. We were just on there. Jerry Springer. No, we were just, you were on the Jerry Springer show? No, 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 no. We were on Jerry's. So in federal prison today, they're still talking about that case, uh, actually. It's a case of technology going awry, or maybe working too well. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the FBI has always been connected uh, with bank robbery investigations. That's really how we got our start, those hoodlums that use that we described earlier in the, in the Kansas City Massacre. We're robbing banks to get their funding. So bank robberies still take place on a, on a broad scale. 50, about 50 bank robberies a year take place in Kansas City, about one a week on average. Uh, this guy actually, one of the most notorious bank robbers in the Kansas City area, uh, he was, we called him the countdown bandit. He robbed, a fifth, he robbed 25 banks before he was finally apprehended. And the reason why they called him the countdown bandit, you see him pointing at the ground there? Uh, he's pointing down because he's telling the employees to get down and, and they have to count backwards from 100 before uh, they can get up again. That was his instructions to them 
each time. That was his MO, same one each time. So they count backwards from 100 while he took money out of the teller drawers. They left and they count backwards 99, 98, 97, and no one got up in any of the bank robberies to ever see him driving away in his own car with his own license plate uh, 25 times. And we don't want bank employees getting hurt, so they did the right thing. It's okay, it's only money, you know. You know, we can print money, we're the government, we'll just keep printing it, it's no big deal. <laughs> We don't want anybody getting hurt. So on the 26th bank robbery that he tried to, to undertake, he's in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It was just like the old days. You know, he was going all throughout the Midwest robbing banks. Hot Springs, Arkansas, walks in a bank. Everybody get down. This is a bank robbery. Goes behind the teller drawers, takes out the money, tells people, don't uh, get up to your account backwards uh, from 100. As he's getting ready to leave, there's one problem for him in the bank, in line to cash a check, is an Arkansas state trooper who is off duty in plain clothes, and as he's get ordered to get down on the ground, the Arkansas State Troopers are looking at him. Now he's on a picnic, going on a picnic with his family, who are out in the car, wife and kids, right in front of the bank, and he's in there to cash a check, but he's not armed, he's in plain clothes, he gets down, watches him take money out of the drawers. As he's taking money out of the drawers, he sees in his hand is a gun, but the trooper notices it's not a real gun, it's a BB gun. So the trooper says, hey, I could take this guy if anything goes wrong. You know, he gets a round off, he's not going to hurt anybody. So he gets up, he tackles him to the, in the, to the ground, right in the lobby there. Down he goes, and his wife and kids are out in the car. The troopers is looking out in, in the bank, and they're going, hey, Mom, uh, Dad got in a fight in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, and she says, great. Oh, my husband goes in to cash a check. Now we're going to be late for our picnic because he's wrestling with a guy in the bank. Uh, that's how they caught this guy uh, after, and the good work of a police officer, and we often count on the police to do such good work to help our cases as well, both uh, state and local uh, police officers. A more notorious bank robbery, though, took place right here in Kansas City, and you might remember if you were around at that time. In, uh, the, on the dawn of the new millennium, uh, in 1999, at about 10 minutes to 5, December 31st, a lady walks into a bank, a lady bank robber walks into the Bank of America in Olathe, and uh, presents a weapon and says it's a bank robbery. She gets money and she comes out just like uh, any other bank robber would have done at that point. Only the Olathe Police Department responded to the silent alarm very quickly. In fact, maybe the, a little too quickly. The timing uh, is, was, a, uh, was a, uh, the issue here. They got to the bank just as she's getting ready to walk out the door. What does she do? Uh, she locks the door, goes back into the bank, and now we have a hostage situation. And that hostage situation started at 5 p.m. on December 31st, 1999, and ended at about 2 a.m. on January 1st, uh, 2000. It was really the only thing going on in the year two, uh, as we went over into the new millennium in the United States. In fact, it appeared on the ticker in Times Square as the, as the ball dropped going into the year 2000. Hostage situation in Olathe, Kansas. <laughs> Why did this girl do that? And I, there's a little insight into this, and I'm going to talk about the media in a few minutes here, too, my relationship with the media. But one of the reasons why, uh, why this, ca this case uh, became a, a high-profile case besides the hostages that were held, and none of them were hurt, by the way, was because sometimes the media reports on cases, but other times they also interject themselves in cases, and not, not on purpose. She picked up a phone of one of the hostages, a cell phone, and called Channel 9 because she was watching a TV in the bank while she was holding hostages, which was tuned to Channel 9. She calls up Channel 9 and says, I want to speak to somebody about, my, about what's going on, and she talked to Chris Ketz. Uh, Chris Ketz, a reporter with Channel 9, and here's what uh, Chris Ketz asked her on the air. He said, he said, why do something like this? And she says, I had nothing to lose. Chris says, why, what do you mean you had nothing to lose? Now, this is all going on while the hostage situation is, is taking place. And he, she says, I, I mean, I lost it all. I lost my job. I lost my family. lost it all. What had happened with her is she went to the casino, and she had been going to the casino quite a bit, lost the last of her money uh, at the casino, and her boyfriend broke up with her, and that was the straw that pushed her over the, uh, over the limit, and she couldn't handle it anymore. She decided to rob this bank, and the police showed up. She goes into the bank and creates the hostage situation. But anyway, you might remember from that case, what happened, no one really got hurt, and uh, someone to wrestle the gun away from her about 2 a.m. in the bank, and uh, one of the hostages did. The police FBI SWAT team came in and arrested her, and it had a good ending, although it did take place on that very important time uh, at the, on New Year's Eve. So that was, uh, that was the bank robbery uh, that I remember the most. Now, uh, a lot of people ask me, too, Say, hey, Jeff, did you ever go undercover? Did you want to go undercover? Have you been uh, uh, one of those secret agent men, you know? 
He said, well, you know, I, I never really thought I'd ever do undercover work because it's, it, it's a different type of personality to do that. I don't think I'd be really good at it. But I was thrown in once to this undercover role, a kind of an impromptu undercover role. So let me tell you about that. And I'll explain it this way. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut. Before, well before I joined the FBI, and I come from a big Italian family. There were five boys in my family, and every Christmas we got together around the television and we watched a uh, movie. Uh, this movie taught me a lot about life. It was a tradition on Christmas Day. It taught me a lot about life. It taught me about loyalty. It taught me about how business should be conducted. Uh, have you seen this movie? Yeah. Okay. That's not the movie we watched on Christmas Day. It was actually this movie that we watched on Christmas Day. <laughs> How'd you go in there for a minute? So, so uh, why, uh, why, do I, why was I so interested in The Godfather, and why do I make my kids today even watch The Godfather on Christmas Day? Well, well and they say, hey, Dad, come on, it's Christmas. We've got to watch The Godfather again. I said, yes, and if you complain, we're going to watch Godfather 2 and Godfather 3. Uh, so I always had an interest in the inner workings of the mob, and, and so you can imagine my excitement now. In 1988, I'm working white-collar crime on a Friday afternoon one day, about 10 minutes to 5, this agent comes in from our organized crime squad, and he walks down the hall, walks into our squad room, and he says, hey, anybody want to go on a search warrant on Sunday? We need a volunteer. When you're new in the FBI, you want to do everything. So I raised my hand and said, yeah, I'll go along. Besides that, I knew it was connected to organized crime. So we show up uh, that Sunday morning. I go with the agent, and we show up at a bookie's house in Brookside, Missouri. And so we bust the bookie. He's not under arrest. Here's a picture of the search warrant. And I'm with an agent named Al. So this is the, I've taken out his last name here. And I'm with the agent, uh, Al, and he's interviewing the bookie. And I'm at the bookie's desk. And he's got all his bookmaking records there. He's got his betting lines and the whole bit. I got my gun on, my badge, my ray jacket. And uh, it's a Sunday morning. It's September. So baseball is in season. Football is in season. What might you imagine happens next while I'm sitting at the bookie's desk on a Sunday morning? Uh, the phone rings, right? So the phone rings. And I'm not sure what to do, because I'm still only in the bureau a couple months. So I go, hey, hey, Al, excuse me, the phone's ringing. And what should I do? He says, go ahead and answer it. Yeah. All right, so I pick up the phone. Now, before I tell you what happened next, I'm going to back up just a little bit. In Connecticut, where I grew up, my dad was a small business owner. He owned a Hallmark card store, and he also owned a retail store. We called it Jet Variety. Uh, Jet Variety. Here's a picture of Jet Variety from the 1970s. It's in a town called Norwalk, Connecticut, which is basically a suburb of New York City, about 40 miles or so from New York City. And so I work for, I know this doesn't look like much from the outside, but I worked for my dad in this store during my teenage years, and I saved money for college, for graduate school. And working in my dad's store, uh, there's a group of guys that used to come in and buy a newspaper from me. You know, we were in the New York metropolitan area, so we sold a newspaper called the New York Post. Now, you've heard of the Washington Post. The New York Post was nothing like the Washington Post. In fact, the New York Post had headlines like this. This is a, that's just a famous headline from the New York Post. The New York Post was the newspaper that told us that Tiger Woods was not really a tiger, he was a cheetah. That's the New York Post for you. Yeah, you get it? Tiger, cheetah, tiger, yeah. So go back to the 70s now. I'm working in my dad's store. These guys would come in and buy the New York Post. They'd stand off in a corner. They'd flip it over. They could care less what was on the front page. They'd flip it over to the back. That was a sports section. And if you flipped about four pages in, you'd find the betting lines. And so these guys would come in my dad's store, buy the paper, and talk about what games they were going to bet on that day while I was waiting on customers over here. So they'd say things like, I'm taking St. Louis minus 105, taking Dallas minus 3, taking Detroit plus 105, Chicago minus 250. And they talked about all the betting lines, the over and the unders and the other lines. And as a kid, as a teenager now, listening to these conversations, just as I stood there by osmosis, I heard them. And that's how I learned all about gambling. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Fast forward 15 years, I'm at the bookie's desk, we're executing the search warrant, I'm at the bookie's desk, the agent says, answer the phone, I pick it up, and the guy on the other line says, uh, who's this? I tell him my real name, because it's not undercover, I just tell him, it's Jeff. And he doesn't say, Jeff who? He doesn't say, Jeff, where's my normal bookie today? He says, hey Jeff, what's the line on the Chiefs today? So I knew how to read the lines, I remember from my dad's store, so I look down at the page, I see Chiefs are minus three, I tell him, uh, Chiefs are minus three. Now wait a minute, this is 1988. Chiefs are plus 60 points, I, I think. <laughs> Chiefs are minus three. How much you want? He goes, give me 25 on the Chiefs. So I said, okay. So I take down the guy's bet. The next guy calls up, what's the over-under on the Vikings? And I knew how to read the over-unders. They go, it's 42, 43, how much you want? He goes, give me 50 on the over. I go, you got it. So I take down his bet. 
one guy calls up and he goes, wants to do a parlay bet. Now, a parlay bet is a little more complicated. You do a two-team or three-team parlay, and you got to win uh, all the bets, but you get odds if you win. He forgot what the odds were on the parlay bet. So he, go, he goes, hey, Jeff, I'm doing two-team parlay. What's that pay? And I remember from my dad's store, it pays 12 to 5. So I ask him, how much you betting? He goes, 50. I go, pays 120 if you win. He goes, okay, give me Yankees and the Jets. I go, you got it. So not only am I taking their bets, I'm instructing them on how to bet <laughs> at this point. <laughs> By the way, the only, question, the only person that's questioning the fact that there's some strange guy named Jeff answering the phone taking bets is the FBI agent in our office downtown. We have the phone tapped. He's got the headphones on. He's going, wait a minute. Two FBI agents go in there. They take out this bookie. Now some other bookie named Jeff is answering the phone. <laughs> One guy was so loose with his information. He goes, hey, Jeff, I don't know you, but I get paid on Tuesdays. You're still going to pay me, right? I said, yeah, yeah, I played along. Yeah, 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 we'll pay you. And then, and then he, he gives me his first name, last name, address, and he spells it out by letter to make sure we had it. This is Mike Smith, S-M-I-T-H. I live at 333 Maple, M-A-P-L-E, Kansas City, Missouri, 64105. You're coming over on Tuesday, pay me, right? I go, don't worry, Mike, we'll be over. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> well, finally, one guy calls up. After about an hour of that, he calls up, and I tell my name, Jeff, and he says, Jeff who? So now I don't know what to say, so I tell him the truth. I'm not undercover. I just say, Jeff with the FBI. And I expect to hear, click. I don't hear click. I hear hysterical laughing. He's cracking up, Jeff with the FBI. Jeff with the FBI. That's a good one, Jeff with the FBI. Yeah, that's good. Hey, Jeff with the FBI, give me 50 on the Chiefs. <laughs> he bet anyway, even though I told him who I was. Weird stuff happens. Um, all right, I got a few more minutes here, and we're going to have time for questions as well. But I want to talk about another, the topic of my book, too, is uh, how I transitioned from becoming a spokesman to uh, becoming an agent to, uh, to be a spokesman. That's why it's called Pistols to, to Press. Uh, the role of the communication is important in the FBI because only one agent in every field office, well, one or two, uh, uh, is selected, or you get volunteered to do this because no, they're not going to force you to do it but uh, to be a spokesman for the FBI. And I uh, did that in 1990, and I started to like it, and so I continued to do it throughout my career. And that's one person that represents the FBI to the media. So uh, in having dealt with the media over the 18 year, uh, last 18 years of my FBI career, uh, I want to show you what it's like to deal with the media. And I'm going to do that with a video. And this is, in the f this is kind of a metaphor for what it's like when the cameras get turned on. Yeah, hold on. Go. This is Pinky. He's a male. Cat, domestic short hair. He's available for adoption. He's pet of the week. Placer County Animal Shelter. He's a very loving cat. Pinky. 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 Whoa. 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 Pinky. Settle down, bud. Be careful, Cole. I'm going to try to get a catch pole. Somebody get a catch pole. So, in case anyone was wondering, Pinky is still available for adoption. <laughs> Why do I show that video at this point in my presentation? I don't know. I just like to show it, uh, watch it myself. Uh, I like to think of the media as the cat. That's a metaphor. The media is represented by Pinky, and that nice animal control officer, he represents us, uh, the, the spokesman for our agency, police or FBI. And like, everything is fine until the cameras get turned on, and then something goes wrong. And if the media, the cat, senses there's a problem, they're going to dig their claws into you and not let go until you keel over in agony. But it doesn't really have to be that way. And uh, the, what, 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 what does this really have to do with the media? Well, there, there's the media, and there's Pinky the cat. So there is a. a <laughs> I, learned, I learned over the years in dealing with the press a couple of things. Never go on camera without being prepared. Never talk to a reporter without knowing the facts. And of course, be clear and concise, because the reporters have a short memory. And they have a short attention span in many cases. 
especially for television, and you gotta talk in sound bites. If you take 30 seconds to answer a question, the reporters or editors are gonna cut it up into much less than that, and that's when it looks like you're taken out of context. So sound bites are really important, and I learned to talk almost exclusively in sound bites when I talk to the TV, t TV uh, newspaper reporters over time. And one other thing I learned too is never take a, make a comment impromptu off the top of your head, because that can lead to really bad things happening. And I'll give you an example. In Polk County, Florida, a sheriff down there was responding to the press inquiries about a shooting that had taken place. And it was a justifiable shooting. See, this real bad guy uh, was a fugitive. He was caught by these deputies, and before they had a chance to arrest him, he took his gun out and started shooting at them. And these deputies fired on him at the sheriff's department, and they shot the guy. And as it turned out, they shot him 82 times. <laughs> and and so, so it was a justifiable shooting because he was shooting at them, but they shot, there was a lot of holes in the guy. And so the coroner's report was made public and the sheriff had to go before the press and the sheriff was asked the obvious question, sheriff, by the media, sheriff, why'd you shoot the guy 82 times? And his answer was, because that's all the ammunition that we had. <laughs> This is the kind of impromptu comments that you really don't want to make because it doesn't engender a, a lot of support by the public. Now, if he was talking to a group of sheriffs at a sheriff's convention, they would have, they would have stood up and gave him a standing ovation. Uh, but talking to the media, they don't really understand things like that. I also learned, too, for television, because a lot of uh, the work I did was, was with TV reporters, is you've got to have something behind you. If you don't have something behind you when they shoot you on TV, what do they do? They're going to focus real tight on your head. They don't want a blank wall behind you. And, and if that happens, then your head kind of fills up the whole screen. And that happened to me a couple of times. I saw myself on TV and my head's filling up the whole screen. I said, my God, I look like I'm afloat in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> so that's when I learned that you had a backup. To get them to back up the camera, you have a background behind you. So you have the FBI seal or a flag or something. So they forces them to back up. It's a flattering, much more flattering shot. It's not a beauty contest, but what it is, is that uh, it, 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 it eliminates these distractions. A giant head on the screen is a distraction. So you always have a background. Now sometimes, I don't think this video is gonna play, but uh, because we're having trouble with the video, I did an interview recently on my in my neighborhood, and this guy uh, in the neighborhood uh, comes out and walks around. Let's see if we get it to play. He uh, walks out here, and I'm doing this interview on uh, uh, for, for Channel 9, and he comes around here, and he walks here, he walks here, then he comes around here, he goes out of the picture, then he comes around here, he walks around, and he comes out behind me over here, and I turn around and look at him and go, what the heck is going on? Anyway, but I don't have any support to help me to keep people out of the background. All right, some other tricks of the trade that the media used, and one of them in particular is called the dead air snare. Now the dead air snare is something they teach uh, reporters in journalism school. In fact, uh, it's not a trick really, it's more a technique. You ask a question and then the reporter, uh, you get an answer from the reporter give, uh, asks a question, you answer it, and then they leave the microphone there and they just wait for you to keep talking and they don't say anything. And everyone thinks because there's this dead air uh, uh, that you feel like you have to just keep talking. You, and, and that's when they usually get the best responses. So let me show you how this works. Right here in Kansas City, a guy's house burns down. Fortunately, he's not hurt. A radio reporter from KMBZ 980 goes over to his house to see how the fire started, throws a mic in his face, says, what happened? Watch how he uses that dead air snare to get the real cause of the fire. And this was your house? It was my house. What happened? Come on fire. Can you see? Well, I can see that. What happened? Uh, how did it start, you know? Cigarette. Alcohol. <laughs> Passed out my chair with a roll of Jim Bean in my hand. Uh, you're lucky to be, you're lucky to still be here. Can't hurt an Irishman. <laughs> You can't hurt an Irishman, and you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Who could write that? Um, this is what I mean by that dead air. This is what you watch out for. He waited, the reporter waited 4.2 seconds in between cigarette and alcohol. That's when he got the real cause of the fire, just that dead air. And he admitted, of course, alcohol was involved. But that wasn't all. He waited another two seconds or so to get uh, what really happened. The guy passed out in his chair with a bottle of Jim Bean in his hand. Jim Bean. Listen, if you're going to burn your house down, would you at least get the name of the booze responsible, correct? <laughs> it happens to be called Beam. All you have to do is go pick up the empty bottle in your living room, look at the label, and you can give that information to the reporter. Jim Beam. There's an M, not an N in, in Beam. Uh, sometimes reporters do something, not very often, but sometimes they, uh, you agree to do an interview, and then they, and then they, uh, they change the topic on you. 
Uh, let me give you an example of how that happened. So uh, one day, uh, this was prior to the year 2000, in late 1999, there was speculation that terrorists were going to strike uh, at the dawn of the new millennium. So Fox 4 interviewed me about that, and I was on live on their show, and uh, they wanted to know what the FBI was doing to prevent that type of thing from happening. So here's what I thought they were going to say as they interviewed me on this live program. I figured, here's what the interview's about, this is what they're going to say. They said, there have been reports that terrorists are planning to strike at the dawn of the new millennium. Here to talk about what the FBI is doing is Jeff Lanza. So that's what I expected. But as I got in the studio at Fox 4, I got wired up for the interview. They put the microphone on. The thing was in my ear so I could talk to the anchor. And they hand me the script. This is the script that's going to appear on the teleprompter that the anchor reads. And I thought I was going to see something like this. But what I saw was this. As I'm reading in kind of horror, here's what they were going to say in introducing me. The dawn of the new millennium have brought reports of an apocalypse. The Bible mentions a sacred area in the Middle East where the final battleground between good and evil will be fought, signaling the beginning of the end of the world. Now here in our studio is Jeff Lanza to talk about it. I'm not making this up. So what do I do? I don't want to seem antagonistic and say, hey, Mark, I'm not here to talk about the beginning of the end of the world. So I ended up just making a joke of it. And here's what I said uh, at, that, uh, at that time. I gotta tell you, Mark, that's the first time I've done a lot of TV interviews. That's the first time I've ever been given the intro. It's the beginning of the end of the world, and here's Jeff Lanza to talk about it. <laughs> well, but, hopefully uh, that will not be the case. But <laughs> let's, let's hope not. It never happened uh, since then. Sometimes the media also, uh, you'll notice this when you watch network news, they tend to embellish stories. So, and a lot of times people don't correct them, and if you don't correct an embellishment or an inaccuracy, people implicitly accept that that's what happened. Uh, so one time I got to talk uh, to Connie Chung on her show, and, and Connie Chung used to have a primetime show a few years ago. Someone was sending hate letters to churches in the Kansas City area. It wasn't a huge news story. It was a serious event. Uh, but the uh, Connie Chung's producers called me and asked me to come on and talk about it. I went on with one of the ministers who got one of the hate letters. And it wasn't really uh, a, a, even a federal crime, but the FBI was assisting the police on the matter. And I told the producer that. So Connie Chung sets up the program, she starts reading in, uh, in the preamble to this interview that uh, racial tensions are at an all-time high in Kansas City, and she goes on and on with stuff like that. And then the minister comes on at first, and she goes, Minister Smith, what do you think about this? And he stops her in stride. He says, he says this. He says, uh, Connie, I heard what you said about racial tensions are at an all-time high in Kansas City. Nothing's, nothing like that is true at all. That, that's just crazy. And Connie Chung freezes in mid-step. This is live TV, four seconds. She doesn't say anything, and four seconds on live TV is like an eternity and so nothing happens from that point from that point on for four seconds and then she goes to me and she says well agent lanza this is a federal crime the fbi is investigating well, i already told her it wasn't a federal crime i told her producer so i said well no connie it's not actually a federal crime that we're investigating so there was another two three seconds of silence and, the, and it just went downhill from there but it was all because the, the the minister corrected her on this situation but in any case they even put in the chiron there in the in the in the uh, they said mailing threats threat, uh, mailing threats is a federal crime true but it, we, there were no threats in the letters. Anyway, so about two weeks later, I'm reading the New York Times, and I see a story that Connie Chung's show has been canceled by CNN. And they, uh, in the New York Times story, they, had, they quote Ted Turner, who's the head of AOL, CNN, Time Warner at the time, and his quote was this, he said, he said her show was just awful. And I'm thinking, you know, that, that interview was awful. He was watching that night. And that's why he fired her, canceled her show because of that interview. And people often ask me, say, hey, Jeff, what's the most important case you ever worked on in your career? So, well, the time of the, when we get the baby back from the hospital, second most important, the, com the time I got Connie Chung fired from her job. <laughs> <laughs> you got to correct fallacies and misimpressions as well. Uh, and, and this is what the media does. Now, there's a movie uh, that you may have seen a long time ago, many years now, Die Hard. And in the movie, there's a scene where the FBI shows up at the scene, and the captain of the police department goes up to the FBI agent and says, I'm Dwayne Robinson, LAPD, I'm in charge here. And the agent takes out a cigarette, lights it, smokes it, blows out some smoke, and says, not anymore. It's not your case. And there's a picture of him doing that. We don't do that kind of thing. We don't take away cases from local cops at all. We don't do that at all. There is one whole day at Quantico, Virginia, uh, where in the middle of all our training, they stop all the training. And whether you smoke or not, they give you a pack of cigarettes. And they teach you how to smoke just that way when you take away <laughs> cases from the cops. Also in that movie is a little, uh, another agent that was with him when he's talking to the police is uh, this agent Johnson and he whips out his credentials like that and he says, I'm, the FBI, I'm with the FBI, here's my credentials. That's not how we take out our credentials. We don't do it like that. I carried my credentials right here in my pocket and every time I wanted to interview somebody, I just took them out and I said, sir, I'm with the FBI, may I speak with you please? And they would uh, usually, the 
person or whoever I was talking to would say yes or no, but that's how you do it. You show the FBI credentials like this. It's a flip of your credentials and it's done about shoulder height. You just flip them out like that. Now, these are stamped retired now, so I can't use them to arrest anyone, but I can use them to get out of a speeding ticket from time to time. I just flip them out the window uh, at the police officer. The flip is like that. Look at how he's flipping in the movie clip there. You don't flip like that. That's a low flip. It's very disrespectful. You don't do low flips. <laughs> Only high flips is all we do. So in Kansas City, Kansas, one time I walked up to a lady, before I retired, of course, I said, ma'am, I'm with the FBI, Jeff Lanza, may I talk to you, please? I gave her the nice high flip like I'm supposed to. She did not like being flipped by the FBI. She looks at my credentials, she takes a step back, she takes out her flip cell phone, she flips it open, she says, Dolores Woods, not FBI. <laughs> what? I flip you, you don't flip me with a cell phone. We don't take away cases from police. Here we are uh, in, a, in a case, uh, and I'm talking to the press. I already spoke to the press. There's me, sheriff, highway patrol. We all work together. And the movies, don't, look, don't believe what the movies uh, make it look like we take over these cases. There's, a, there's the sheriff, there's the highway patrol guy, and we all work together. And there's me, we got the feds, county, and state. One problem with that picture, though, one problem, I don't have a hat. <laughs> the sheriff has a hat, highway patrol sergeant has a hat, even the unidentified man in the back has a hat. <laughs> So how do I fit in? I got my fedora, and now I fit in a little bit better. And just in case the police aren't cooperative, I got a pack of cigarettes handy, and I got a smoke and... Uh. Sometimes the FBI does this to themselves, though. I've seen it happen where the FBI acts like, you know, they're big and bad. And, and one time in uh, New York City, a friend of mine was telling me an FBI agent who's head of the New York office is walking to a press conference. And he's, he's, it's about organized crime. And he's going to, to say this to the press. He tells my, spoke, my counterpart, the spokesman up there, here's what I'm going to tell the press when we get in front of the cameras. Here's what I'm going to say. The FBI is twisting the tourniquet on the tentacles of organized crime. <laughs> so my buddy, my counterpart up there goes, don't, don't say that. <laughs> he's the head of the New York FBI office. He gets up there and he says it anyway with cameras are turned on. Ladies and gentlemen, the FBI is twisting the tourniquet on the tentacles of organized crime. He said it perfectly, but there was an Associated Press reporter in the back that copied it down wrong, and there, the story went out over the wires that the FBI was twisting the tourniquet on the testicles of organized crime. <laughs> now listen, that's a metaphor, and you're supposed to envision metaphors. I don't think I want to envision that one, that one at all. One more thing about the media, we're almost at the end here, but I think uh, one of the things I learned when you talk to, to the media and to the public, of course, is you want, the public wants to know that you care. Uh, you don't want to be some, some talking head. I think it humanizes you as an organization when you show empathy. So I decided to do that one time, uh, more than once, of course, but on this clip you're gonna see with Larry King. And I thought, I'm gonna be interviewed by Larry King. Now, Larry King is the best interviewer in the world, right? He's been around for interviewing people for, for years for decades, maybe even centuries, I, I don't know. And I say, he's gonna ask the toughest question right out of the box. So I go on Larry King, I'm in Kansas City, he's in New York, he turns to me and he says this, and by the way, uh, this is what I mean by empathy, uh, that Teddy Roosevelt had it great. He said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's where empathy comes in. So here's Larry King's question of me. Uh, first question, it's gonna be tough from Larry King. Here's what he says. Stan, is, is this an FBI matter? So he asked me this, uh, Agent Lanza, is this an FBI matter? I'm sitting in his studio, I'm all wired up, two million people are watching, and he's asking me, is this an FBI matter? No, Larry, I'm just here because I just want to be. We have nothing to do with the case. <laughs> of course it's an FBI matter. That's not what I said. Here's what I said, and here's where the empathy comes in. Stan, is, is this an FBI matter? Yes, it is, Larry. I'd first like to take the opportunity to express our condolences to the family of Bobby Joe and all the others affected by this, by this tragic crime. So that just took a few seconds to say, and I think, again, it humanizes you as an organization. Poor, we people are more likely to believe and, and listen to what you have to say if you think you care about them. And we didn't cause the murder of Bobby Joe, but I think a, 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 a statement of empathy is really important, and that's what I, I try to do throughout my career as a spokesman. Uh, so how did I handle the media? Uh, like the beasts that they were, uh, trying to control the media, right? <laughs> Here's how I did it. That's the metaphor for the wild media. Yeah, you just take a gun and control them like that. So let me close with this picture of the baby. So how did this come about? This is the baby that was kidnapped from the hospital, one, the one I showed you earlier, baby Carly. One year after the kidnapping, and I should tell you how we got the baby back. 
So we show up at the mother's, uh, at the hospital, KU Med Center, and I'm there to talk to the press, and I talked to the Asian in charge, and they had no good leads at all. No one really saw anybody in the maternity ward. There was no surveillance video except for one piece of video that caught a couple walking out of the hospital about the time the baby was taken, but it only showed their backs, and it was very grainy. I took that video, put it out to the media anyway. It went out to the press, and then someone from North Kansas City Hospital called and said, we saw that grainy video with the backs of people we had two weird, really strange acting people in our maternity ward last night. They had actually gone to KU Med Center to take the baby at 11.30, but two hours before that, they were at, K they were at uh, North Kansas City Hospital. And that picture was from North Kansas City Hospital, where they did not get a baby, but we were able to identify him from that picture, which was obtained based on the other picture that we put out, which didn't show anything that was uh, usable. Uh, anyway, we got the baby back. Uh, within 23 hours, uh, the baby was unharmed. The couple was arrested. And then one year later, uh, we had a little birthday party for the baby at the Kansas City FBI office. And I said, well, do you mind if I invite the media to come along? So uh, the Kansas City Star took a picture of me holding the baby in 1999, uh, baby Carly, one year old. That picture was in the Kansas City Star, but it was also in the National Enquirer. I never thought I'd ever be pictured in the National Enquirer. <laughs> Uh, I didn't give, physically give birth to the baby myself. Why would I be in the National Enquirer? So then 10 years later, when I was getting ready to retire, Kansas City Star did a story about me retiring. They used a file video, file picture of me holding the baby in 1999. Carly's mom calls me that day when the paper appeared and said, We'd like to, I'd like to have Carly come in and meet you and, and, uh, before you retire. And there she is in 2008. So that story, as more detail, is in my book. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, just a couple more things. People ask me too, Jeff, how do you know a meth lab when you see one? How do you know a meth lab when you see one? So just so you know, here's how you know. Very briefly, uh, meth lab when you see one. There's a yellow lab, <laughs> black lab, chocolate lab. There's your meth lab right there. <laughs> Watching the show as a kid, I uh, loved the suits they wore in the show. Even when Ephraim Zimelis Jr. was shooting somebody, he had a great suit on. Yeah, it's not like that in real life. Here's a real FBI agent arresting a real crook, Andrew Fastow with Enron, the CFO. Look at the difference in the suits. Look at the agent suit. I think that's probably 199 bucks on sale. Look at how nice the crook suit is. Probably $2,000 custom made. Look at how easily the agent suit wrinkles there. Look at that. Look at how nice the crook suit lays. Even while handcuffed. I have this great idea for Brooks Brothers, because there's so many white collar cases today. Brooks Brothers ought to have a separate line of clothing. They could target it towards white collar crooks so they can maintain their elegant style while being arrested. <laughs> they could even use that picture there as an example. And what could they call it? Let's see, I think about this. What do I call it? What could they call it? Ah, the Brooks Crooks Collection uh, is what they could call it. <laughs> and if they get convicted, they could trade it in for an orange jumpsuit. Uh, Thanks for paying attention. Uh, I'll have time to ask questions. One more video, please. Thank you for paying attention, just like this guy is paying attention. I've had a plan to protect small business owners, local officials, the high sheriff is with us today. Worried about the quality of the education of the community in this group. They can receive federal support for their work with All right, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.